we've been looking at the power of God, and we've been looking at it through a number of different lenses. Most recently, we started looking at the idea of uh, the power of God is exhibited through his power over life. And when we say that, again, generally that phrase, when we use that phrase, the power of life, we say the power of life and death, right? That's how that phrase generally goes when we talk about it. Uh, but as we mentioned last week, uh, that's sort of a misnomer with God, right? Because, look, and it's really with all of us, for that matter, uh, none of us has the power of life. All of us have the power of death. That is, anyone in this room could kill anyone else. So just think about that pleasant thought for a moment. Uh, that, that is a power that is within man's purview. We can kill people, but none of us can bring someone uh, to life or give life, but God can. And so we're looking at this idea of God's uniquely divine power to give life. And, and we mentioned last week that that starts all the way back at the very beginning of human history when it says in Genesis chapter 2 that God breathed the breath of life into man and he became a living soul. And so God has been using this power from the beginning and we want to focus on, or that's most clearly seen I guess, when we talk about the accounts of resurrection that we can find in the Bible. And last time we looked at the first account of a recorded resurrection that the Bible has for us, and that's when Elijah goes and he raises uh, the widow of Zarephath's son who has died. Uh, and we looked at that chapter in 1 Kings chapter 17 and noticed that the whole chapter really is about God's power of life, starting all the way back when the uh, drought is proclaimed by Elijah and then God says, go to the brook and I'm going to command the ravens to bring you food and they're going to keep you alive while you drink from the brook. The brook. Uh, that dries up and he says, go, I've commanded a widow uh, down here to provide food for you. And then God miraculously uh, provides a constant source of oil and flour they can use to survive uh, while the famine is growing worse because there's no water in the land. And then it concludes or culminates with him raising the son from the dead. Uh, we notice then that we picked that story because it was the first uh, account of a resurrection that the Bible has for us, all the way up uh, in 1 Kings is where it takes place. Today we actually want to turn and we want to look in John chapter 11, if you're still there from the reading uh, that we had just a minute ago. If not, you want to open back up. We're going to look now at the longest recorded resurrection story that the Bible has for us, taking up uh, this whole chapter really of John 11. We want to look at the story of the resurrection that we find uh, with Lazarus. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4, and we'll jump down to verse 14. But in John chapter 11, it starts like this. It says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister was Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment, and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified by it. And then jump down to verse 14 uh, for a minute. It says, Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. After there's a conversation about whether or not he's going to recover or not, Jesus tells them right out, Lazarus is dead. And he says, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there for the purpose or to the intent that you may believe. And now let's go to him. We start this story of John chapter 11, of the story of Lazarus. What we want to find here right off the bat in these couple of verses is really uh, the theme not only of the whole story, but also of the power of life that God exhibits. And that's this. This story really serves two purposes. And Jesus makes those two purposes clear in these first couple of verses. He says back up in those first four verses there, uh, in verse 4, that the reason that this has happened, that the purpose of this sickness and all of the things that are going to occur following that, is so that God might be glorified. That's the purpose of the story, that God might be glorified. And then the second purpose we find down in verse 15, where Jesus says to them that, look, I'm glad that I wasn't there and that he would die, because if I was there, I would have healed him. But I'm glad that I wasn't there so that, or for the purpose of, your belief, so that you might believe. And so when we look at this story, Jesus says to the disciples there, it has two functions for them to see, those disciples that were with him at that time, that God would be glorified and that they would believe. And what I want us to examine or consider is that that miracle, when God gives life, when he uses that uniquely divine power, that those two purposes are served even today. 
That is, when God uh, uses that power, God is glorified. It glorifies the divine. Resurrection does that. And it does that because we see clearly in it that it's something we cannot do. And so the only purpose is that God is glorified. And second, what we see is that resurrection causes belief. That's what it does. It causes people to believe. That is the purpose of God exercising his power of life, both in that story then and in any account that we might read about resurrection. Let's consider then the miracle as it plays out. So for context there, we didn't read all of it, but Lazarus was sick. The disciples say, oh, he's sick. Are we going to go? And he says, no, we're going to stay here. And they stay there a few more days, and he says, hey, we're going to go down there now. Lazarus is asleep, and I have to go wake him up. And they say, oh, good, if he's sleeping, he's going to get better. And he says, no, 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 I mean he's dead. Uh, let's, let's go down there now so I can wake him up. Right? And they say, oh, okay, let's go down there. And so they head on down there, and as we get down into verse 15, we find Jesus, or verse 16, uh, 17, 18, as we move along, they go down, they make that travel there. And we want to pick up the story again in verse 17, where we then find Jesus arriving on the scene uh, where uh, Lazarus has died and been buried. So let's pick up the reading in verse 17 through 27. It says, And when Jesus came, he found that he had been laid in the grave for four days already. Now Bethany was near to Jerusalem, about one and three-quarter miles off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. And then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said this, she went to her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master has come and has called for you. As we look at these verses here, what we want to find is some interactions that start when Jesus shows up on the scene. Now, the first thing we want to recognize and realize, because it will become important as the story moves along, is it says, this little side note that John throws in there for us, that when he gets there, he's been dead for four days. Okay? That just to let you know, that's how long that's gone on. Just file that away in your mind. It'll come again later, and it's going to be important later in the story. But when you get there and the, the scene begins to take place, the first thing that we find is that Martha comes out to him and she says this statement. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When she says that statement to Jesus, what she says is she's proclaiming that, Jesus, I believe that you have that power of life dwelling in you. I believe that. Because I've seen it time and time again as you've gone around, you've healed these people. I've seen you before, in fact, or I've heard of you at least, raising people from the dead previously. You realize that? When this story takes place and Jesus goes and raises Lazarus, this is not the first time he's done this. I mean, you would think by reading the way the story plays out, if you only had the Gospel of John and none others, you would think this is the first time Jesus has ever raised someone from the dead. This is quite amazing. No one had seen this before. But that's not true. Jesus has already raised at least two other people that we know of from the dead by this point. She comes to him and says, I know that if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She recognizes Jesus' power to give life, at least to the living. Right? And then she says this statement, which says, uh, And yet I know that even now, whatever you ask, God will do it for you. Now, it seems to be that she's saying, Go ahead, raise him up from the dead. This is great. Let's, let's do this. But then the rest of the story doesn't quite play out like that. Because when Jesus says to her, clearly, your brother's going to rise again. You would think that she'd say, great, let's do that. But instead she says, no, I know that. But what is she referencing? She says, I know that he'll rise again in the last day. When the resurrection happens and we're all raised and stand before the judgment, of God, I know, yeah, I, I got that. So there seems to be a bit of a disconnect here in, in Martha's mind. Uh, and we're not quite sure what she's asking for, but clearly she at least recognizes in some sense that if you had been here, still be alive. Because that's just who you are. 
Now Jesus turns around to her and says something uh, impressive. He says something impressive to her. What he says to her is that I am the resurrection and the life. When she says to him, I know he's going to raise again at the resurrection, he says, I am the resurrection. The resurrection is not something that's happening out here in the far distant future, Martha. The resurrection is standing in front of you right now. Do you realize that's what he's telling her? She's pointing to an event in time and he's saying, no, that's me. That's not a then thing. That's a now thing. I'm here. I'm standing right in front of you right now. I am the resurrection and the life. And in so doing, not only is he trying to reset her frame, but he's also claiming the divine power for his own. Isn't he? Saying, I am the resurrection and the life. The divine power, the power to give life, rests in me. I have it. I have that ability. And he says it in a way that proclaims it not just that I have the power to raise your brother from the dead. Right? He says, in fact, I have power over eternal life. Because he says, if someone dies and, and believed in me, then they'll be raised again. And if someone who believes in me lives, he's never going to die. He says, I have power beyond, a power of life that goes beyond this physical, mortal realm that you see around you. That's the kind of life that I have. Now, when Jesus lays that idea out for her, he then asks a question. And the question is fantastically simple, right? He says, do you believe that? Do you believe that's the case? That's an interesting question for him to ask, right? I mean, she's come out, and it seems to be that she's saying, look, Lord, I believe, I know that God will do whatever you ask. She's come out and said, I know that had you been here, I believe that had you been here, my brother wouldn't be dead right now. Jesus says this thing and says, do you believe that? She's professed certain things about what she believes about Jesus. And Jesus says, let me tell you a little more. Let me get you to understand a little more. You believe this, but do you believe that? That's what he's trying to get her to understand. That's what he's trying to get her to see. That's what he's trying to get her to say. And she comes back with a response that says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which would come into the world. You know, it's interesting that we don't get any sort of response there from Jesus. I, mean, I find that somewhat strange. Uh, or at least I'd like to know what he's thinking. Maybe I should put it that way. I'd like to know what he's thinking. Right? I'd like for him to say, like, good answer. That's what I was looking for. Or, not quite, but you're getting there. Right? Like in other places, where you're not far from the kingdom. I'd like some response from Jesus to know if that's the right answer there. Right? I mean, it's like uh, me asking a kid uh, for an answer, and he gives me an answer, and I go, okay. And then we just move on, and the kid's going, um, am I right? Am I wrong? What's going on here? But Jesus' point is this. Look, there's a certain element here that's important, and that is belief. Do you believe that I, Jesus, have the divine power of life, and not only in this world, but in the world to come? Do you believe that? That's what he wants to get her to think about. Now, he's going to perform something to give her all the evidence that she's going to need. Right? It's like when Jesus performs the miracle where he tells the man who, who can't move, who's paralyzed, hey, your sins are forgiven. Right? And everyone goes, it's easy to say, right? But who can know? And so he says, well, just so you know, I'll get up and walk too. He's going to do something very similar here, isn't he? He's going to say, I have the power over eternal life. And just to prove that, I'm going to raise this guy from the dead. So that you know that that's the case. As we move on in the story, what we see then, we'll read 28 again. It says, when she had gone, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, and said, the master has come and he calls for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now when Jesus was not yet come into town, but was still in the same place where Martha had met him. And the Jews then, which were there with her in the house, and comforted her. When they saw Mary, that she got up hastily and went out, they followed her, saying, She is going unto the grave to weep there. And then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. 
And some said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? When we look at this section, what we see is some, some interesting parallels, right? When Mary comes out, notice she uses the exact same words uh, that Martha did, right? Uh, which sus raises a suspicion in my mind anyway that perhaps they've had this conversation at home, right? Oh man, if only if Jesus had been here. She comes out and says, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And what we see here moving forward in this next section is this interesting idea that while Jesus has just claimed divine power, he's now going to juxtapose that with his humanity. Notice how many times we see that laid out here in this section. It says that uh, when she comes out and has this conversation with him, that he's groaned in his spirit. He feels that. He understands what's going on, what emotions she's feeling. Jesus knows what he's going to do, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't feel for this woman. It says he's groaned in his spirit. It says that he turns and he asks, where have you laid him? Again, somewhat of an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, Jesus knows where he's at, right? Jesus knows he's in the grave, yes. And not only that, I mean, I would imagine if I went to a town and there was the gravesite outside of town, I'd know where they laid him in the gravesite. But Jesus is divine. I mean, remember what he's told him? Hey, remember before I saw you, you were under that tree over there? Remember how Jesus has all of these times this knowledge of people's inner workings and minds and thoughts? Jesus knows where he's at. He doesn't need someone to tell him, oh, we laid him in grave 4B over here, down, down this row and then over to the left. Jesus knows where he is, and yet he asks anyway. Why does he do that? And then it says that he weeps when he sees those weeping. It says Jesus wept. What we find here is that Jesus is juxtaposing humanity with divinity, and he does that because he wants us to understand something. And what we need to understand is that God exercises his power of life. God exercises his resurrection power. God uses that power because he loves humanity. That's why God does it. God loves humanity. He loves people. And because he loves people, he takes his divine power and he brings it down to conquer death. That's what he does because of who he is. As we start reading again in 38, it says, Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, came to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone was laid over it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Didn't I say unto you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And when they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you heard me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had spoken this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said to him, let him loose, or untie him, and let him go. As we look at this section, when Jesus turns and says this, understand here the scope of the miracle. What's impressive about this miracle that makes it different from many other of the uh, resurrection stories that we have is that all the resurrections we've seen up to this point are of someone who's died recently. Do you notice that? I mean, when this boy died last week, he didn't die last week, but in the story last week when the boy died, right, how long did it take before Elijah brought him back? Minutes? Maybe an hour total, right? He dies. Elijah's in the house. And the woman says to him, he's dead. Why did you do this to him? And he says, give me the boy. And he takes him upstairs. Right then. When we go and read the other stories in the Bible that have been resurrection. Story, Elisha, it's a very similar story. The boy dies of a headache. And he says, go. And it's the same day Elisha comes in and takes the boy up and raises him from the dead. When Jesus is going about uh, earlier in his ministry and he goes to the, the Nain and he sees a woman bringing a boy out. The, the funeral happened the same day the boy has died and he, they're carrying him out right then and he stops they're going to bury him he's not buried yet and he says hey and he raises him up all of the stories happen very quickly the challenge here at least in Martha's mind is what it's been too long right like Jesus you could have saved him if you'd been here and he wouldn't have died and even if you'd showed up a couple days earlier we probably would have been all right right if he'd be showing up the next day or the same day and he was already dead, you could, have, you could have brought him back up. I mean, we've done that before. We've seen it happen. But now, it's been four days. Now, I don't have experience with human bodies, 
and being dead for four days, right? Especially not in this condition. But you, uh, just like I, have probably all had experience with something that's been dead for four days, right? I mean, you have something like a, a mouse. Like we have it all the time. A mouse will get stuck in our pool, right? They, they get down in the pool filter or something like this. And they get stuck down in there. And they get caught in the basket. And you go out there and you open it up. Ooh, this is bloated, waterlogged mouse in the, in the pool, right? And after a couple of days, and that's been sitting in the chlorine, kind of keeping it fresh as far as you could consider that. You're like, ooh, that's bad, right? That thing gross. You have pets. You know, your pets ever catch a bird or something, right? And you go out and you find the bird carcass out there the next day, and you're like, ooh, that's, that's a mess. I mean, that's what they're telling him, right? I mean, they didn't embalm him. They didn't do any things. They took him out. They put some spices on him, maybe. They put him in a cave in a roughly desert-ish climate. Said, it's been four days, Lord. You don't want to open that up. What's the point here? Why does Jesus wait that long in the first place? What are we trying to find out here? Corruption is set in at this point. He stinks. But what we're seeing here is that there is no death that's greater than God's power of life. Look, it doesn't matter if he's been dead for four days. It doesn't matter at all. Her concern is you're going to raise him up and what's it going to be like? Jesus says it's not a problem because my power of life is greater than any death out there. In fact, didn't I tell you that? Didn't I just tell you that, Martha? Didn't I just tell you I'm the resurrection? I got this. You're going to see the glory of God take place. What are you concerned about? Move the rock. Move the rock. And then just like in that Elijah story, just like that in Elijah's story, what we see here is that the divine always commands life. Right? When Elijah was being taken care of, God said, I've commanded ravens to feed you. When those run out, right, and the brook dries up, he says, I've commanded a woman to go and make sure that she keeps you alive. And in the same way here, what we see is Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. He commands it. Because God has that kind of power over life. Well, as we jump down to verse 45, it says, Then many of the Jews which came up to Mary and had seen these things which Jesus did, believed in him. But some others went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done, and then gathered together the chief priests and the Pharisees of council and said, What are we going to do? For this man causes and does many miracles. If we leave this man alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come, and they will take away our place and our nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said to them, You don't know anything at all. Nor do you consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation would not perish. And this he spoke not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. And then from that day forward, they took counsel together to put him to death. Notice how the story concludes. Notice what we see here is the result of this life power being displayed. The result of the power is exactly what Jesus says it's going to be, right? What did Jesus say when he said, I'm glad that I wasn't there, so what? So you can believe. And then as soon as the miracle happens, what's the very next words out of John's pen? And then many of the Jews that were there believed. Because that's what happens. When you witness resurrection, that's what happens. You believe. Now notice, there were some people that went away and they told uh, the, the Pharisees and the high priests and those people, Right? But you notice what they also did? They also believed. I mean, nobody went back to the Pharisees and said, hey, Jesus pulled off this great trick where there was this guy who we thought was dead, but apparently he really wasn't. Nobody went back and said, there was this guy who was dead, and Jesus performed this trick where he didn't really raise him from the dead, but someone else who looked like him raised from the dead. No, they went back and said, hey, we got a problem here. Jesus just raised somebody from the dead who'd been dead for four days. And just another chief priest said, that didn't happen. No, the Pharisees said, no, no, I don't believe that. Right? Why not? Because when that happens, everybody believes. Now, the problem here is this. Some people just refuse to submit. Some people just refuse to submit that. They say, if we let this go on, someone's going to take away our power. going to take away our place. And we don't like that. And so instead, what happens here is all of these things that just occurred, what does John say they lead to? All these things that happen, what they say is, these things lead to Jesus' death. 
They say, we've got to kill this guy. We've got to wipe this guy out. We have to get rid of this guy. We're going to kill him. He says, and then from that day forward, they really stepped up their efforts. They brought their A game. They wanted to kill this guy. Jesus bringing life leads to his death. But you know what's great? What does that lead to? It leads to life. Right? And John says that. He says, what happened there is all of those things Jesus does because he wants to lead to life for everybody. And that's going to bring glory to who? It's going to bring glory to God. Just like Jesus said at the beginning. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come to you and we thank you for this time we've had to open up your word. We thank you for your word which you've preserved for us. Uh, we're so glad that you've given us this detailed account of Jesus when he was here on this earth raising Lazarus from the dead. Uh, we're so grateful that you have given us these examples of Jesus raising people from the dead to display that he had the divine power just like you have. That he was God here in the flesh and that he had that power of life. And just as he said, as he proved by raising Lazarus, that he is the resurrection and the life. And that those who believe on him will never die. And that we will all be raised up with him in the last day. Father, we thank you for him and his sacrifice and his willingness to go through with these acts that he knew would going to bring about his own death. But he also understood uh, that his death was going to bring life for many. And so, Father, we thank you for him and his sacrifice. We thank you for the display of power that you have uh, shown us in your word today, Father. And we pray that as we go out this week on our ways that we would remember that power that you have over life and that we would go pause uh, and give glory and honor and praise to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.